Welcome everybody to this uh, Zoom seminar lecture uh, from the Center for the Study of Governance and Society. Uh, I'm Mark Pennington and I'm the director of the center. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us here today, uh, Barrett Richmond uh, from Duke University in the United States. I'm particularly pleased because of the way that um, Barrett's research fits very much with one of the themes that we've been exploring in the center over the last three years. And that is the extent to which, if at all, market transactions or market institutions can be governed outside um, of the state. If they can, what are the kind of conditions that facilitate that governance outside of the state? And also what are the limitations? What kind of conditions might restrict the scope um, of the governance of markets outside of the state? So Barak has a really superb book related to this theme, Stateless Commerce, um, which is published by Harvard University Press in 2017. And some of the themes in that book, I think are going to inform his presentation to us today. So we're gonna use our, our usual format in these, um, these presentations. We're gonna allow Barak to speak for probably about 45 minutes. And we'd invite you to put your questions in the various comment boxes in the Zoom format and we'll collect those questions up at the end of the presentation and put them to Barak and have hopefully an interesting discussion about what he's going to speak to us on today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Barak Richmond. Barak, thank you very much. Mark, thank you very much. It really is a pleasure to virtually be here. It would have been a greater pleasure to be there in person. Hopefully we can work that out in the future. Um, I, I was mentioning, as I was mentioning to you earlier, uh, this project, this research project, and more generally my research interests, intersect really perfectly uh, with your research priorities at the center. Um, and uh, your, the, your approach at the center, um, I think really is the right way to approach these questions from an interdisciplinary perspective that involves both economics and politics and philosophy um, uh, in a really unified approach. Um, so uh, hopefully this is a conversation that will continue beyond today. I certainly uh, would be delighted to get feedback on this research trajectory from you. And I would be delighted to hear more about the research that you were doing at the center um, because there are not a lot of places that think about economic and political institutions in this way. Um, so I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So, uh, I'll give a quick overview of the talk today. I'm gonna to talk about the diamond industry. And in particular, I'm gonna take a very institutional transactional perspective. I'm going to talk about what makes the diamond industry, I wouldn't say unique, but certainly distinguishable from most industries. And it all breaks down to the diamond transaction. Um, as Mark said, uh, a lot of my work looks at the diamond industry, but particularly it uses the diamond industry as a window into understanding the role and the limits of the state and the role and the limits of non-state actors. It really is a very useful device to understand other institutions of governance. Um, and the reason it's so useful, uh, I argue, uh, can be illustrated through the very rudimentary, very foundational transaction of the diamond sale. Once you understand that very, very basic building block, the diamond sale, um, and how uh, it presents certain governance challenges, then you can begin to understand the institutional context uh, that has grown around the diamond industry. So I'm gonna offer an introduction to the diamond industry, particularly on the particular transactions uh, that uh, are the building blocks of the industry. I'm gonna talk about how cooperation, and what I really mean by that is uh, the governance of transactional relationships uh, that do not rely on state enforcement. Um, this is cooperation. This is a, a, co a collective um, reputation mechanisms. I'm gonna talk about how that kind of cooperation is sustained I'm then gonna talk about what's happening over the last couple years, really only about the last eight or nine years, uh, maybe 10, for how the cooperation that sustained the industry over the last century is really starting to die. You could call this the autopsy of cooperation. 
And then at the very end, I'm gonna offer some new questions and new directions uh, where the research is going. Um, I don't have a lot of slides dedicated to these questions, but I have a lot of questions and I would um, especially eager to hear feedback uh, on those new topics, um, if not today, then beyond. Um, and as Mark mentioned, uh, this, a lot of these ideas are embodied in a book uh, that came out recently called Stateless Commerce. And by the way, uh, the, state, the word stateless um, is uh, meant to mean how cooperation and commerce uh, and governance can happen without any role of the state, of the formal polity. So let's talk about the diamond industry. So diamonds are mined from the ground um, and they ultimately are sold uh, as jewelry, uh, at least uh, the large stones or middle-sized stones are. That's really most of the value of the industry comes from. There are some industrial uses for diamonds, um, but most of the dollars that are generated from the mines uh, are, are from uh, diamonds that go into diamond jewelry. Now, What's really important to understand about this distribution system, about this supply chain, is that there are an enormous number of intermediaries. So De Beers for a long time, we'll talk about De Beers, but De Beers for a long time um, controlled most of global rough supply. A rough diamond is the diamond as you find it after it comes out of the ground. Um, but then if you, think, if you look, jump to the end, you see the end buyers of diamonds. Those are mostly jewelry manufacturers. And by the way, uh, the diamond content of diamond jewelry is about a $72 billion industry. It's a very, very large industry. Um, more than we, yeah, it's a bigger than, bigger than the auto, bigger than the auto industry, bigger than the, um, uh, not the auto, bigger than the cereal industry, but bigger than uh, the movie industry. It's a very significant uh, global industry. Um, but what happens between the diamond being mined out of the ground uh, and sold to the jewelry manufacturer is really what distinguishes this industry from a lot of supply chains. And it's the part of the story that I find most interesting. These are the intermediaries. Um, they mostly are comprised of diamond dealers and diamond brokers and cutters. So uh, the dealers are simply people who buy and then sell diamonds. Uh, and for the most part, most diamonds, after they are, co if they are extracted from the mine, um, uh, go to London. Uh, this is especially true historically when De Beers really controlled the industry. And then De Beers sold its diamonds, its rough diamonds, through what are called site holdings um, to uh, dealers that are atop the diamond chain. These are people who simply purchase diamonds from De Beers. Uh, and then gradually resold them in increasingly smaller parcels. Um, a lot of these dealers sold their diamonds through brokers. Um, a lot of the dealers uh, would then cut or polish the diamonds, sell them to subsequent dealers who would then uh, cut and polish the diamonds. Um, what we have is a distribution chain where individual diamonds would transact, would change hands, many, many times uh, through lots of independent businesses uh, before they're purchased ultimately by the end buyer, but the person who actually puts, sets the stone into the jewelry. It's what we call a disintegrated supply chain. Um, and there are lots and lots of intermediaries. Now, a lot of these intermediaries find their way or, or, or do their business in the United States in a place called 47th Street, the Diamond District. And that's really what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to begin the conversation there. But just so you know, um, this is a, a, a Bain's uh, overview of the supply chain, the diamond supply chain. And you can see, if you watch my cursor here, you can see that there are enormous margins in rough diamonds. That is, uh, it is very lucrative if you can find a diamond mine in the world. Most diamonds right now are mined in Africa, although increasingly there are mines that are found elsewhere in the world. Um, most my, uh, it is, it's very lucrative to mine the diamonds and to sell them as rough. The margins are about 25%. Over here, you can see the retail industry also has some fairly significant margins, especially for large diamonds, especially valuable diamonds. Um, so to the degree that you can get your hands on large diamonds uh, and set them uh, and sell them in a large prominent retailer, there also are significant margins. 
But this is the world that I'm looking at. This is the world of intermediaries that operate really at very, very low margins. Um, and as I said, there are many, many intermediaries for each parcel of diamonds. Uh, getting from uh, selling it from the, from the mine to selling it to the jewelry manufacturer, to the retailer, it passes through many hands. And a lot of those hands are on 47th Street in New York. So this is a picture of Fifth Avenue with 47th Street right there. That is the beginning of 47th Street. Recently, the city of New York has uh, erected these little gates that look like diamonds here. Um, and 47th Street is a different world. That's really where I wanna begin the conversation. This is where intermediaries in the United States, the diamond intermediaries in the United States congregate. This is where most of their businesses are. And when you go down 47th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue in the Diamond District, it looks very different from the rest of the country, from the rest of the city. Um, this is the beginning. Again, we have these little gateways. This is, the, this is the entryway into 47th Street from 6th Avenue in New York. And instantly, once you walk down 47th Street, you see different people. You see uh, business people. Um, that are very different from the business people you see in the rest of Manhattan. And this is right in the middle of Manhattan. For those of you who know what Manhattan looks like, 47th Street is right in the heart of Midtown. Fifth Avenue is the retail center. Sixth Avenue uh, is the commercial, the financial center. And I asked my 11-year-old daughter to create a little video that presented the book um, and I gave her a lot of the pictures that you, that you just saw. And I think she does a really nice job trying to capture almost the um, enchantment of the block. Uh, so I want to, it's just a short video. I want to play this video for you uh, as an introduction to what really not only the focus of the book, but was the origin of my fascination with the industry. If you visit Midtown Manhattan, you might stroll down Fifth Avenue and witness one of the most cosmopolitan retail centers in the world. You might also stroll down Sixth Avenue and view the Rockefeller Center, international bank offices, and other heights of today's modern commerce. But if you wander from Fifth to Sixth along 47th Street, crossing from high fashion to high finance, you will find yourself in what looks like an ancient barter economy. New York's 47th Street is the epicenter of America's diamond industry, and to the visitor, it might feel like a time bubble. Instead of midtown stylish shoppers and elegant business people, pedestrians on 47th Street are a cross-section of global economy with different ethnicities, languages, and energies unfurled in the street. Business is organized around family and community networks, and disputes are resolved privately without relying on courts or legal enforcement. This insular commercial world is explored in Barack Richmond's new book, Stateless Commerce, The Diamond Network and the Persistence of Relational Exchange. It delves into the world of diamonds and asks how millions of dollars worth of diamonds can be transacted each day without formal contracts and law enforcement. It then uses the mystery of the diamond industry to ask broader questions. Conventional theory shared by policymakers, economic historians, and all shades of academics says that modern legal institutions are necessary components in the path of prosperity. Why then, in spite of rejecting the very institutions that received credit for building modern economy development, do ethnic commercial networks still dominate certain industries well into the 21st century? Alternatively, if certain ethnic economic networks thrive in modern economy, why do they not dominate a larger portion of modern talks? This book explains why and how ethnic networks succeed where the instruments of modern commerce fail, and it teaches that ethnic commercial networks encounter their own troubles. And so, while modern and pre-modern economies live side by side in 21st century New York City, they also compete with and consume each other. I just want to pause on and this picture consume. right here. Um, 
this in many ways encapsulates the question I'm trying to answer. Uh, in 21st century New York, you have these two different economies, the modern and the pre-modern, right next to each other. Um, and as I said before, the initial fascination, the motivation, the, you know, the curiosity underlying the book is why does the pre-modern exist in the heart of the modern? Um, and if you can think about these two systems of exchange, systems of governance uh, as Kosian neighbors, uh, then you might try to ask the question or try to understand what kind of transactions occupy the modern world on the left and what kind of transactions occupy the pre-modern world of the right. Um, and in particular, why is the diamond industry in the right and so much of the rest of the world is on the left? Uh, that is the intellectual genesis of the project. Um, and I really like the way my daughter put it that way. So, so as I said before, the, the way I begin answering these questions, and maybe it's my disciplinary bias. Uh, I'm a student of Oliver Williamson. Uh, I'm a student of transaction cost economics. Um, we were always encouraged to look at the building block, at the transaction of industries to try to understand the institutional relationships or the institutional context in which transactions take place. We begin with the diamond industry, we begin with the diamond transaction. And the diamond transaction is really extraordinary in the sense that it is very unlike so many other transactions uh, in the modern economy. Um, so the way we talk about transaction transactions and transaction cost economics is looking at challenges or hazards, transactional hazards. Um, you know, a typical transaction where I give you a widget and you give me a dollar, um, that's a fairly standard transaction that involves very few governance challenges, if it's, particularly if it's a spot transaction. The diamond industry is very different. So first of all, there is subjective valuation. Um, uh, val valuing the, the uh, or estimating the value or estimating the, the projected profit uh, that one dealer can obtain from a particular stone is highly subjective. Um, you'll see on the picture on the bottom left uh, that uh, in-person inspection, especially of mid-sized to large stones, is really critical uh, in this transaction. This is not something that is easily transi uh, transitioned uh, to a digital space. It very much has to happen in person. And it's subjective in the sense that the great value uh, that these brokers can capture from the stones they have is to find the right buyer. Um, much of the diamond market is a market for information, trying to match stones with buyers as it is uh, anything else. There also are a number of hazards uh, in, uh, that accrue to the purchaser. Um, uh, there is has, something we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there is a danger that the stone that you purchased was sourced from a place where uh, that is uh, riddled with conflict diamonds. diamonds uh, that fuel really bloody and really oppressive um, uh, political rebels. Uh, and uh, that is something that purchasers do not want. And to some degree, it's something that regulators have tried to stamp down on. But this is something that's very difficult to verify at the point of scale, at the point of sale. Um, similarly, some diamonds are treated with lasers to fix certain occlusions. And those are also hard to inspect. So to a large degree, the purchaser of a diamond um, encounter certain transactional hazards that uh, are very difficult to govern through contracts, uh, very difficult to investigate uh, and confirm uh, with uh, inspections. But the real hazard, the real uh, problem or challenge that diamond transactions have is a problem of enforceability. Um, diamonds are mostly purchased on credit. Um, and the reason for that is because you have sales that are highly, um, uh, sales that are highly um, concentrated in certain times of the year. Um, you have independent dealers uh, that have significant liquidity constraints. Diamonds, of course, are really expensive, at least, uh, uh, and most of the margins are in some kind of value added. So you're making a very significant purchase or you're purchasing a very expensive asset trying to create additional value from it and then reselling it. This is a market that uh, is uh, highly dependent on credit. So the rudimentary transaction is I 
give you the diamonds today and you promise to pay me in a month or two months. Um, and that gets into the probably the, perhaps the most significant feature of diamonds, which is that they are concealable, they're easily portable, uh, and they're universally valuable. I give you the diamonds today and you're gone. That is the central transactional hazard. How do I know that uh, you won't run away with the diamonds? And by the way, these transactions are significant dollars. Um, whatever assets you might leave in New York, a house, a car, um, they often pale in comparison uh, to the kind of value that you would have uh, by taking the diamonds to uh, some beachfront property uh, very far away from the courts of New York and living off the diamonds that you promised to pay me for later. This is a court failure. I, the, the, the courts, the modern courts, as we have constructed them, are incapable of governing that transaction. If I give you diamonds today and you promise to pay me later and you do not pay me later and you leave, I might be able to sue you for whatever you've left, but I can, that, that will be inadequate to deter you if you are purely calculative uh, from taking the diamonds and running off. Courts, we have lots of instruments that courts use. We have liens, uh, we have attachments, uh, but we have marshals. We might be able to hold individuals in contempt if we can find them. But for a transaction where the value is enormous and easily portable, uh, the institutional and jurisdictional limitations of courts simply uh, prevent them from serving as meaningful governance in a diamond transaction. All right, so what do we have so far? Uh, we have uh, an interesting industry uh, that is global in scope with lots of intermediaries, uh, with lots and lots of transactions, and none of those transactions, most of which are credit sales, can really be secured with the modern legal institutions that we rely on in so much of the rest of the economy. So, how are these transactions secured? Well, what is colloquially used is this notion of trust. And the New York Times is, is fast, like, like many writers, the New York Times has been fascinated with 47th Street. Um, and there's a very interesting column written in the early 1980s calling trust the real treasure of 47th Street. And trust, you know, the, 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 the scholar of governance recognizes trust colloquially, no, is the response to court failure. And we have lots of quote, uh, lots of quotes from the from lots of scholars who have studied the diamond industry, uh, identifying that trust really is the way uh, people are compelled to keep their promises. When I first entered the business, the conceptions of truth and honesty were simply the way to do business, and nobody decent would consider doing it else, uh, other, doing it differently. Um, that uh, in Lisa Bernstein's famous article in 1992 about the diamond industry. Um, uh, Alyssa Shore uh, is, a, um, is an ethnographer that grew up in 47th Street and talked about it. Legal and moral accountability is the foundation for the very survival of the industry. And Renee Shield is another an anthropologist, ethnographer who looked at the diamond industry and she talks that uh, informal contracts are heavy with moral weight and embody certain principles to honor commitments, to produce a good product, to stand by it, to preserve reputation. Um, and even more recently, Elisa Otulski wrote, in this business, everything works on credit, loan, and trust. Well, all right. I mean, I suppose there's your answer, right? I mean, we can't rely on courts. Instead, we rely on trust. And that's how we govern these transactions. Now, if you're an economist, or even if you have a little bit of skepticism, this isn't enough. Um, the basic question you would have is, why is trust-based exchange the equilibrium. Why is it that uh, if you simply think about this from a game theoretic perspective, why is it that at every moment when I am entrusted with somebody else's diamonds, I decide to cooperate instead of to shirk? Why is it that I decide to repay instead of simply taking this enormously valuable cache of diamonds and running with it? Well, uh, that requires Answering that question requires a deeper institutional analysis into what really makes the diamond industry work, what makes these intermediaries work. And I'll focus on New York. The, uh, the center of gravity 
in the New York Diamond New York Diamonds District is the New York Diamond Dealers Club. This is a voluntary association that has bylaws. Um, being a member of the Diamond Club is very significant. It's a it's a hallmark, a, a denotation that you really have a significant credibility in the industry. Um, and by the way, New York is a really important place. Um, uh, and about almost all diamonds that enter the American market, which of course is the largest global market for diamonds, go through New York. Um, and therefore, we really have to understand the mechanisms that underlie the Diamond Dealers Club if we're to understand 47th Street and the diamond industry. Now, what's perhaps most notable about this club is the way it resolves disputes. Um, and what it has is mandatory arbitration uh, where arbitrators are fellow club members, uh, they are elected to their positions to be an arbitrator is also uh, a position of real authority and respect. Um, and by the way, this is also a, a little picture, I should say, the, the, to the left is a picture of the old New York Diamond Dealers Club, to the right is the current uh, entryway. Um, it's very hard to get in. Uh, I was one, in once, but I couldn't take my camera. This is a terrific picture of the Diamond Club in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Um, and by the way, uh, New York is not the only uh, diamond district. Um, there are very significant diamond districts throughout the world. Most notably, Antwerp uh, has a very significant district. Uh, Mumbai uh, and Tel Aviv, I would say, are probably the four most active diamond districts in the world. And this is the diamond, and they all have diamond clubs and they all have associations and they all rely on arbitration. Um, and I just, you know, I like this picture from the Israeli club because it shows you how dealers uh, gather. Um, they uh, are always positioned to inspect other people's diamonds or always in position to sell whatever diamonds they have. It's, it's very much like a stock exchange where traders with different assets gather uh, to buy and sell. So how does it work? Well, um, according to the, uh, the New York Diamond District Club's bylaws, um, and this is common for all bylaw, for all uh, uh, trade associations, um, if there's a dispute between two dealers, um, one person is late, one person didn't pay, um, one person gave uh, a, a, a flawed diamond contrary to a promise, you file a dispute before the arbitrators and there's an arbitrator hearing, and then there's a determination of a wrongdoer. The arbitrators decide, make a decision. A owes B a certain amount of money. And that person can pay. You know, if I, if a, a person is found uh, but to be obligated to another diamond dealer by an arbitrator, they have to pay. Now let's think about what happens if they don't pay. If they don't pay, the diamond club then publicizes the wrongdoer. First of all, they're expelled from the club. If you do not comply with arbitration rulings, you are expelled. Um, there also are lots of informational mechanisms where basically, if you are in default to an arbitration hearing, everybody knows about it. And this is really what the Diamond Club does. It is a source of disseminating accurate reputational information. And what happens after that is especially interesting. So yes, it's true, you might get some kind of fine from the Diamond Club, but that's not really what would deter theft. What really deters theft is that it triggers uh, a group boycott. Uh, you are no longer able to engage in business in the industry. And by the way, people who are found to do business with people who have been expelled from the Diamond Club also suffer reputational sanctions. But there are also a series of non-economic sanctions. So here is the game theoretic question. How can a future of uh, a, a future in which there is a denial of future business, no future dealings, and there are also some non-economic sanctions, how can that be enough to compel cooperation at the moment of sale? And remember, these diamond sales are really large. If I have the if I am given the possibility of taking a, a running with a large cache of diamonds, um, how can future trend, how can future uh, sanctions compel me to cooperate 
given the incredible possibility uh, of profiting at the, first, at, the, at, the, at the moment of sale? Well, the reason it works is because of who the diamond merchants are. And this is where social and historical and community institutions play such an enormously important role in the diamond industry to support the economic institutions, the market institutions. And you know, the, the basic insight, and this is I think the first insight I made in my first paper in the early 2000s, is that the diamond industry works because of who the diamond merchants are. Every person in the diamond industry, everyone, every, every one of those intermediaries who have in their possession a diamond that belongs to somebody else, or better yet, a diamond that they have not yet paid for, they all belong in one of two categories. They're either long-term players, they're members of family businesses, um, uh, or they are members of a religious community. In New York, it's primarily the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Each of these, and there's some overlap also, some individuals are in both communities, both categories. And each of these categories, um, or individuals in each of these categories have what we'll call distinctive utility functions. And if I'm a family member, if I'm a, if I'm a member of, if I'm a long-term player, a member of the family business, I have the capacity, the opportunity to bequeath my reputation to my children. And therefore, over many generations, I have, you might say, an infinite timeline of transactions. And by the way, it's not just financial, it really is quite meaningful to be able to bequeath a thriving business to your children. And that's enough to compel me to cooperate at every moment. I know that I have an endless supply of fairly lucrative businesses uh, that I have for the rest of my life and my children's lives. By the way, this is mostly a father to son, uh, uncle to nephew business. And the way that we explain sustained cooperation is simply through folk theorem economics. But there also are a lot of other individuals who are not really compelled uh, by to uh, not attracted to the prospect of bequeathing a business. To a large degree, these are folks uh, who have work, work at the lowest margin jobs, the jobs of brokers and maybe cutters. Um, but those are people who are motivated by a different utility function. Um, there is a lot of literature among the economics of religion that characterizes something called club good economics, goods that you can only get from your particular community. Um, and in religious communities, club goods are, 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 are very prominent. Um, uh, access to certain educational uh, institutions, access to teachers, being able to my, marry your children to people who have high status. Um, these are community goods that are allocated by the insular community that is only important to people who are in this community, but they are of enormous importance to people these, of this community. And the basic idea is that if any of these individuals breach a financial obligation in the industry, then they suffer economic and non-economic sanctions in these, through these community institutions. And these are quite meaningful. These really are uh, what you could call the nuclear option. These, this is, these are very severe sanctions. Okay, so what have we done so far? Uh, I've given you the thrust of the book. I've talked about how the diamond industry encounters uh, very significant transactional hazards. Uh, they are almost entirely outside the reach of the law. Uh, and I've talked about how trust uh, or um, colloquially known as trust uh, governs those transactions instead. And when we talk about trust, when the economist talks about trust uh, and cooperation being uh, an equilibrium uh, that characterizes the vast majority of transactions among diamond dealers, we really know that trust is something that is backed up by community sanctions. We have the private enforcement through community, through community institutions to enforce these transaction sales. And uh, to the outside observer, to the ethnographer, to the reporter, this looks like a very happy world of a moral economy. But now I'm gonna talk about bullet three of my talk. Um, this is no longer true. And this is a very really new phenomenon. Uh, this is what I will call how trust breaks down uh, or the autopsy of cooperation. Um, if you walk down 47th street now and you say, hey, I hear diamond dealers trust each other. This is what you'll hear. 
there are some people who cheat and they re-enter the business. Um, this person I was talking to, that's what happened to me. You could hear something break in his voice. This is something that's not supposed to happen. It's certainly not supposed to happen on a regular basis, but it is. And a lot of the diamond dealers are really lamenting what's happening to the industry now. Um, and it's not just personal experiences where individual diamond dealers are being cheated, uh, where someone's not being paid and, not, and there is not an appropriate sanction uh, that's coming to follow. It's also that the institutions that are being designed, that are designed and for a long time have sustained trust are also breaking down. Uh, there have been a number of DDC scandals um, where officers have engaged in self-dealing, where the arbitration system has no longer been as reliable as people would want. Um, there, are, there is something rotten in Denmark. I don't want to present myself as a Shakespeare scholar, especially with this one, but recognize that I'm, that's the second Shakespeare reference I've had. Um, so what's happening? How can this happen? And this is really some very recent developments but I think they are really transformational. And they might mean that the Diamond District in New York and other Diamond Centers might be on the verge of changing permanently. So there are three changes that have happened that have eroded cooperation. One is what has happened at the very top of the industry, the, the mining industry. And this is really mostly what De Beers has done. The second is what's happening in certain, in the retail industry. And there've been some changes that have been, I think, fairly significant. Um, uh, on the sales end. And then also what's happened in the middle, what's happening to the world of intermediaries is really interesting. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I really want to, uh, I really want to uh, spend more time on Q and A. But the main point here is that the economics of cooperation have changed. If over the last century, the equilibrium of cooperation is simply because the prospects, the benefits, of long-term cooperation exceed the benefits of cheating in the short term, that economic calculus has changed. And it's quite significant that if you change the numbers, you then see dramatic institutional change around you. So let's talk about De Beers. De Beers for at least a century has been the monopoly provider uh, of, of diamonds. And this is a terrific source that look, if you look at the very top here, diamonds have been a very, very steady price. These are other commodities that have good price, where prices have gone up and down, but the price of diamonds has remained steady and simply because De Beers has always monitored the market. It's been able to release and also hoard diamonds in a way um, uh, to make sure that when prices go up, output increases and when prices go down, there's greater hoarding. Um, and accordingly, because De Beers was a monopolist, it was incentivized, you might say, to uh, promote sales of all diamonds. And the greatest uh, slogan in advertising history in the 19, uh, 2000, in, 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 in the 20th century, and this is not just me talking, is a diamond is forever. De Beers was trying to promote the sale of diamonds, of all diamonds. And was incentivized to do that, even though it only operated at the top of the supply chain, it was incentivized to do that because it had a monopoly. But look at what has happened to De Beers market share since 1989. I'm happy to talk about why this happened, but it's mostly because of uh, the entry of new mines and other things. And also uh, this, the former, the Soviet Union became the former Soviet Union. And in becoming the former Soviet Union, uh, it decided to do something independent from De Beers. So what's this mean? Well, De Beers decided that it could no longer become, it could no longer survive as an upstream monopolist. And instead it had to get into the margins of retail. So it's not what Tiffany's does. And Tiffany's of course, uh, in profiting from high retail, it has, a, it has a store on Fifth Avenue. It has a very special box. Well, this is what De Beers is doing. De Beers collaborated with Louis Vuitton and even after a century of only being at the supply level, only being at the very top of the supply chain, it now vertically integrated and entered into, um, entered into the retail market. And incidentally, this also means its advertising market is different. It's no longer advertising diamonds. It's advertising De Beers diamonds. Only a De Beers diamond uh, is worthy of your purchase. Now, um, 
I'm just going to focus on this email right here. This is an anonymous email written by an intermediary, a diamond intermediary. And he's writing it to all of his fellow intermediaries. And what he's saying is that De Beers is no longer selling us wholesale prices um, that will allow us to profit. De Beers is now increasing the prices. Now it's, it's counterintuitive because De Beers is losing market share, but wholesale prices are going up. And the reason for that is that Previously, De Beers always wanted to support the intermediaries, always wanted to share some of the monopoly profits with the intermediaries because that distribution chain created an enormous amount of value for De Beers. It allowed the right diamond to get into the right person's hands. It was a terrific information market. But now De Beers is a competitor. De Beers is also a retailer and De Beers is no longer invested in the kind, uh, in the economic benefits and the economic liveliness of the intermediaries. So what we see is this very significant market shift atop and De Beers responding in a very significant mar uh, uh, strategic direction. And it has resulted in higher wholesale prices. And there's also have been some additional competition on the retail end. Now, as I mentioned before, most diamonds are purchased in person, but there are some diamonds that are now being purchased on the retail end through the internet. And what's really interesting about this is that the internet retailers are not the Tiffany's. They're not the ones who are really eager to make sure that uh, there is some degree of prestige or some non-economic value, exclusivity to purchasing a diamond. These are volume people. They want to, they want to sell as many diamonds as they can. And that has meant that a lot of retail prices, especially for the middle to low end diamonds, has gone down. So what have we seen in the last 10 years? We've seen wholesale prices go up and retail prices go down. And that has squeezed the intermediaries. Uh, and this is what we see right here. We see on the high end, prices are still increasing, but on the low end down here, we see a lot of competition. And we see prices really not going up with, uh, at the rate that they historically have. And what's happening at the intermediaries level? Well, there is an extraordinary influx of new intermediaries. Perhaps the most significant change in the diamond industry in the last 50 years, I'd say, is the growth of the Indian diamond market. market. Um, and Mumbai now, in many ways, is the most significant diamond center, more so, more significant uh, than either Antwerp or New York. Um, and what's really interesting about this is, uh, this is a detail from Kayvon Munchie, who was an economist at Oxford, um, and now is an economist at Brown University. And he's noted the number of firms, family firms that have entered the industry, the diamond industry, um, and have really made the industry much more competitive. The intermediary is much more competitive. And what he also has noted is that there has been uh, an influx, not only of particular sex and families, because of course, the only people that can enter this market are people, are families that can govern the transactional problem themselves. But we also see uh, it with each successive generation, new ethnic groups entering. Um, and he actually makes a very interesting point um, that uh, some of these ethnicities are much more capable of thriving in the diamond industry than others. And in particular, the Katiawaris, who are the most recent entrants in the industry, um, uh, are the most short-sighted uh, and have been the most likely, the least, li as the least likely to keep their promises, the most likely uh, to break their promises. Trust to some degree is, uh, is like love. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. Um, and when you have an influx of intermediaries, many of whom are not driven by the kind of long-term prospects that the long-time family businesses historically have been, and not, I include not just Jewish families, but also the Palampuri families as well. Um, if you have non-Jewish, non-Palampuri families that are fairly new to the industry entering, they're also the most likely to exit and they're the most likely 
to uh, fail to meet their financial obligations and they're most likely to erode this equilibrium of trust. So how does trust break down? We have higher wholesale prices and lower retail prices. There's less money for the intermediaries. Therefore, the long-term prospects of cooperation are reduced. Um, uh, you have greater entry among intermediaries, which increases competition and reduces margins. Um, and you also have other policies that have really uh, encouraged cheating, you should say, or discourage long-term thinking and discourage investments and reputations. So it is a purely economic calculation. The long-term gains from cooperation are now overcome by short-term temptations. Now, by the way, this is fascinating. This is not something that is unprecedented. To some degree, Avner Greif has called this the expected institutional life cycle. When a group of merchants come together and establish reputation mechanisms that work and are mutually profitable, that by definition invites entry. But then once a successful institution invites entry, it therefore reduces margins. And once it reduces margins, the incentives to cooperate are dulled and the cooperation stops. Um, uh, and Greif has found a number of different uh, temporary equilibrium of cooperation over history that have, you might say, been brought down by their own success. So uh, I think there are a number of academic findings, um, or there are a number of implications for, for the literature, the academic literature that this erosion of trust uh, has suggested. Um, there have been a lot of uh, investigations in the diamond distribution chain. Uh, and I think those need to be rethought because the diamond distribution chain has been rethought. Um, and you are seeing a lot of vertical integration. Um, you are no longer uh, seeing the kind of disintermediary uh, distribution chain and therefore you need a different kind of institution. And by the way, this does conform with theories of the firm. This is my, um, uh, my theoretical foundation to a lot of the book where the basic idea is when you have a world uh, where, you can where you can achieve transactional security, you're gonna have reputation mechanisms here. Um, but what we're seeing is the inability of reputation mechanisms to really thrive in the diamond industry because of the loss of long-term cooperation. And that's why you're seeing more of the vertically integrated firm. Um, I think this also has some implications of what, how the literature understands what trust really means. And there's this terrific debate, you might say, between Mark Granovater and Oliver Williamson. Uh, and the debate over trust even relates specifically to the diamond industry itself. Uh, Granovater says that trust is embedded in the industry community itself, whereas Williamson says there is an appearance of trust, but it's deceptive. It succeeded only because there are cost-effective sanctions. And I think the erosion of trust suggests that Williamson might have won this debate on what really motivates trust. It's really calculative trust. It's not something emotional. It's something that is really subject to something that is uh, deeply calculative. Um, and if trust is not financially uh, uh, sustainable in the long term, then it won't survive. Um, all right, so what are the lessons? Uh, trust is breaking down. This means that we need to rethink our understanding of the diamond industry. Vertical integration is displacing uh, the block booking strategy. We need to rethink our understanding of the economics of the diamond industry. Uh, institutional economics has explanations for both of these. Um, and I think most interestingly, this also reveals the both benefits and the limitations of private governance. Private governance can do a really good job to compensate for court failure for the limits of public governance, but it also has its own limitations. This is my last slide. Um, and I just wanna indulge this a little bit. I know I'm, I'm, I'm hitting my 45 minute uh, outermost limit. Let me talk about what I think are three ideas that I find really intriguing. One is, can we understand the history of the diamond industry as a window on understanding history more broadly? Um, Sven Becker had a terrific book a year or two ago looking at how cotton, looking at the history of a particular commodity, can explain geopolitics for about 400 years um, or even more. Um, how uh, the uh, places that could grow cotton 
led to certain political institutions, how places that were able to industrialize cotton led to certain political institutions, how the growth in cotton in one place and the uh, industrialization of cotton products in another led to geopolitical relations between those two polities. Um, if you look at history through the lens of a commodity, you can explain a lot and you can also understand not just particular micro level institutions, but even institutions at the most geopolitical level. I think you also can understand how uh, you can understand a social history of certain communities, in particular communities that have been uh, uh, that, that exhibit certain features. Um, it has been often said that the Jewish people are the diamond people, and it's largely because uh, uh, the diamond industry has been central to Jewish history for at least the last thousand years, maybe 800 to 1,000 years. Um, and you know, if you think about the economics of the diamond industry and you think about the politics of the Jewish people, especially in Europe, um, there was always a, a, a threat of being expelled. Um, there was a certain distinctive ability to communicate to individuals uh, across political boundaries. You can understand how the Jewish, how Jewish families and Jewish communities found diamonds as a way of really uh, surviving otherwise politically dangerous uh, terrains. Um, and trying to look at diamonds through history can explain a lot of social history for, um, well, for certain religious and ethnic sects. And third, I think you can also uh, look at big questions of the international political economy through diamonds. Um, uh, there's been a fair amount of work looking at how De Beers has been a colonial force in Africa over the 20th century. Um, and that's because you know, the diamond diamonds are both an extractive industry and also a hard currency. That leads to certain geopolitical implications. Um, if we think about diamonds over the 20th century, we might be able to explain some of the politics and some of the economics of Africa uh, and some of the politics and the economics of colonialism. Um, and by the way, this is not just a British story and it's not just a British empire story. Um, it is also a, a story about what some people call new private governance. Um, a lot of the challenges in the current diamond world um, involves a collaboration between uh, uh, global politicians, not just in the national, but also on in the international level, um, and industry leaders. Uh, and the diamond, the world of diamonds can illustrate how some of these uh, relationships between those with political power and those with economic power can shape up the national and international polity. All right. So look, that was a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the main lesson is that looking at some very specific uh, industry and very specific and transactional details can have lots of implications in different fields. So I, I welcome your questions. Thanks very much, uh, Barak. Um, I, I had a question, if, if I can use, use my position as the, the, the chair of the, um, the session. Um, it strikes me that the story that you're telling is um, one which could be construed as being quite sort of static in terms of the actors that are involved here. So you're talking about a particular set of transaction costs, a particular set of relative prices that give rise to a certain set of institutions. Then we have an exogenous shock that explains the breakdown of those institutions. But what's missing there, I would suggest, is some kind of story about how the players within these markets then react to those changing circumstances. So do you have any sense of what kind of entrepreneurial or, or other activity is taking place in response to these changed circumstances? Are people trying to reconfigure the institutions in response to the change or are you just seeing them as kind of passive actors who are faced with this set of changing prices and transaction costs? And that's all we can say about it. Yeah, no, it's terrific. Um, your, your emphasis on the dynamic feature of this is really critical. Um, we should never assume that cooperation is an indefinite equilibrium. Uh, and you know, I, I, I think that looking through the window of exogenous shocks uh, and how it might change equilibrium, 
explains a lot about how cooperation not just falls down, but also how cooperation is, is, uh, is sustained. Now, um, let's think about who the entrepreneurs are or might be. Um, one real central feature to the world of intermediaries um, is, is who they are. They are not technical geniuses. That's not their comparative advantage. They did not go to fancy business schools. Their comparative advantage is who they are. It's their identity. It's who they know and the fact that the people they know trust them, know that they are not flight risks. The reason uh, that for much of the 20th century, the Diamond Center in New York was predominantly Jewish was not because Jewish diamond dealers were more knowledgeable or more entrepreneurial. It was because of their ethnic identities. That was what they brought to the table. Um, so when you see an exogenous shock, when you see that trust is no longer as valuable as some other assets in the marketplace, you would see these individuals losing their comparative advantage. And that's why I think you do not see a lot of dynamism in this industry um, because they're not dynamic people. I mean, their, their asset, their core asset is not forward thinking. It's bringing the institutions that they were born in with them to the marketplace. Um, so you do see a, you see a lot of experimentation. Uh, you see a lot of innovation, but it mostly is coming from outside the sector. Um, and we haven't really, that hasn't settled yet. Um, I mentioned that a lot of retailers are trying to use internet uh, marketing strategies. Um, that is something that is working a little bit. We see De Beers entering into uh, a vertically integrated marketplace where they're trying to market De Beers branded diamonds. That certainly is an innovation, a very dramatic innovation. It might be working. We're not really sure whether that's going to redefine the way diamonds are bought and sold. Um, so I think what now we're in a period of uh, what I guess what some institutional economists would call an era of ferment. We don't have a stable equilibrium yet. Um, but thinking about uh, these trust equilibriums and thinking about the life cycle of institutions through a dynamic lens is absolutely critical. Um, and I think the last 10 years have suggested that what most people thought they were able to conclude as an indefinite world of cooperation uh, over the 20th century is not the case. Great, that's great. Thanks very much, Barack. Um, we have a question from Florian. Um, thanks very much, Professor Richmond, for this inspiring talk. It seems that club governance really is the key to understanding your case study. So I was wondering how exactly decision-making used to take place within the DDC, and also whether you observed some kind of evolutionary competition between the different diamond marketplaces, especially as you mentioned that the importance of Mumbai is increasing. Besides vertical integration, do other marketplaces maybe have um, developed more uh, efficient institutions? Yeah, fascinating. Um, so when we're talking about club governance, I just wanna clarify, there's, there's two ways to think about club governance. Um, it's the DDC as the club uh, that tries to uh, adjudicate disputes within the industry. And then there's also club goods uh, which is how the religious and ethnic communities discipline their own is through the allocation of club goods. Um, so I think you're referring to the, the Diamond District Club. Um, so let's think about this. Uh, in New York, you have a Diamond District Club uh, where about, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, about 90% of the members um, were Jewish. Uh, and you had uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cooperation or the, um, uh, the complementarity of the industries of, of the, in the industry with the indus institutions in the Jewish community serving as governance. But then you had the rise of India. Uh, so what happened when a lot of Indian, in particular Palanpuri diamond merchants and diamond families, what happened when they started to uh, become very economically significant? Did they challenge the governance model in New York um, or did they join it? And the short answer is they joined it. Um, uh, they entered the New York market. They were able to govern their own firms the same way Jewish companies were able to govern their own firms. 
there was a collaboration or an intersection of both economic and non-economic sanctions uh, that allowed uh, Palanpuri Indian families to be very successful for the same reason that Jewish families were successful. They were able to manage the governance problem in an international marketplace. Um, and gradually, uh, as their prominence grew in the world, especially and certainly in New York, you started to have trades between Jewish firms and Indian firms. Now, how is that governed? Um, basically, this sort of is that, uh, and there's a model that can explain this. Um, you have Indian merchants policing their own, even when they transact with Jewish merchants. And you have Jewish merchants policing their own, as they can do, even when they're transacting with Indian merchants. And the reason that that happens is because collectively, both Indian merchants and Jewish merchants, I should say the Indian merchant community and the Jewish merchant community recognize that long-term cooperation is, is advantageous for all of them. Therefore, they will punish their own um, in sustaining collective uh, reputational trust. And that has meant that the when the Indian community was able to exhibit this kind of governance mechanisms in New York, uh, then very, very slowly, but surely they became a, an increasing role. I think their, their presence in New York grew. And you'll see, if you remember those pictures in the very beginning of 47th Street, those were taken you know, around 2015. Um, you saw lots of Central Asians and South Asian merchants there. Um, and, and you see lots of ethnicities, lots of non-Jewish ethnicities in 47th Street. Um, so you see entry is possible when the merchants involved have the same kind of institutional capabilities uh, that allowed uh, the current merchants, the incumbent merchants to, to succeed. Um, so Indian entry would not have happened without uh, Indian merchants having the same kind of capabilities, governance capabilities uh, that Jewish merchants have. Now, that doesn't mean that Mumbai is the same as New York. Uh, Mumbai and its diamond club is different from New York and this Diamond Club, which frankly is also different from Israel's Diamond Club. Um, but they all serve, and, and it's interesting because you see this combination of uh, transplanting institutions with uh, intersecting with local institutions and local cultures. Um, but they all serve the same institutional role of identifying good people with good reputations and bad reputations. Um, and publicizing reputational information. And in that sense, um, you do see a, a certain kind of uh, economic determinism uh, that, has, uh, that can explain the cooperation in these different parts of the world in spite or maybe even because of the very different cultures and languages that they intersect with. I know that only answers part of your questions. You had a lot of other questions as well. Um, I'm happy to follow up. Uh, either privately or, or, or here too. Perfect, thanks so much. We have another question. Um, thanks for the great talk. I was struck by the chart showing price fluctuations of various precious resources. I was wondering if this chart is indicative of an inefficient market due to the various institutional rules actors have adopted. Is there, an, is there any chance that the stability in diamond prices is reflective of an inefficient market from the perspective of the consumer? Is it possible that the high trust levels among diamond merchant, merchants um, aid NYC diamond sellers, the De Beers monopoly aids De Beers, but that these institutional rules don't have positive efficiency or price consequences for the final consumer uh, the NYC dealers are selling to? Yeah. Um, so the question digs at some normative issues that I find really, really hard to answer. So let's talk about the easier parts first. Um, for sure, the stability of prices uh, is only possible because of uh, De Beers' monopolistic control over supply. Um, now, what's interesting, by the way, is that even as De Beers' market share has declined, uh, prices still have remained fairly stable. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, that's because of collusion. 
Um, it's not because of something inherent in the diamond industry. I mean, there's no reason to think that diamond assets would not fluctuate if they were left to the open market. Um, even though De Beers has about 25 to 35% of the market, um, as opposed to 90%, um, uh, the top three sellers have collectively about 80% of the market. And there's a lot of suggestion that there's a, a collusion. So, so uh, you would not have price stability without some kind of monopolistic or oligopolistic control. And you might simply therefore conclude as a matter of IO in a, in industrial, organ industrial organization economics um, that there are inefficiencies simply because you don't have an opportunity where demand can fully meet supply, uh, you have a restriction in output. Now, the reason De Beers invests so heavily in maintaining uh, stable prices is largely because uh, it really worries about um, uh, people trying to game the market. I mean, these are very significant purchases um, and they are worried that any kind of reduction um, in prices, uh, or an expectation, I should say, of a reduction in price, uh, will mean that you know people who are thinking about buying diamonds today will wait until the following year. Um, so it's normatively it's hard to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. On the one hand, uh, it probably means a reduction in output. On the other hand, it also means uh, stable expectations, which means. Uh, you know, you don't have a Keynesian problem you have to worry about all the time. Uh, and you can always make sure that uh, there is not a, 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 an anticipatory hesitation to purchase, um, uh, to purchase diamonds. The, the larger question though, again, if I'm understanding the question about as a normative uh, inquiry is really interesting. I mean, yeah. The diamond industry demands enormously complicated institutions to work. It, it requires a lot of uh, detailed and deep, deeply embedded institutions to incur to, to create the governance that will allow credit sales to move forward. Um, and that means a lot of things. I mean, for starters, it means that um, if you could be the smartest guy from a smart person from coming out of a business school, you won't be able to enter the diamond market because, well, because you're not a long-term player, because you're not a member of an ethnic club. Um, that entry barrier, you might say, is a real inefficiency. Um, and to a large degree, one reason, and I think this re references uh, my answer to, to Mark's question, one reason the diamond industry has been so static, so stodgy is because the people who have succeeded have succeeded because of who they are and not what they know. Um, it's, a, it's an economy of identity and not an economy of merit. Um, so is that a, a, an inefficiency? Well, certainly it's an inefficiency, but as Oliver Williamson has always taught us to, um, when we try to engage in any kind of comparative institutional assessment, you have to assess realistic institutional alternatives. I'm thinking about the diamond industry in a, in a hypothetically competitive market in the Adam Smith sort of world is just not a market that would survive. Um, it's a market that requires very complicated, very rigorous institutions to work. And in that sense, I'm trying to think about how efficiency assessments work versus the hypothetical ideal is not an effective question. What really is, is interesting, which is, where your question is pushing us to move is, well, are there alternative institutional arrangements that really might be able to crack at some of these inefficiencies, these entry barriers, um, uh, this, this uh, history of, of ossified or, uh, or, or unentrepreneurial thinking? Um, are there ways to alleviate those costs while still solving the governance problem? Um, and I think the answer is yes, but it hasn't really born out yet in any kind of stable way. And that's something to watch out for. Perfect. Thanks so much, Brock. Um, we have another question. Thank you for your presentation. It seems that trust here is not simply the trust as a component of social capital, but more about the informal contracting system with rational and prospective calculations of costs and benefits in transactions. 
My question is about the relationship between trust and the formal legal institutions. Is it an either A or B choice or a mutually reinforced relationship? If it is the latter, we might say that the trust system may be strengthen strengthened and keep working if the court system is credible enough, or the collapse of the trust system is a result of a more chaotic market environment with the influx of internet retailers and new entries that are even harder to be legally managed. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, so the heart of the question is, um, are, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, is private governance and public governance, are they complements or are they substitutes? Um, I will tell you that historically they were substitutes in the following way. If I were a diamond dealer and I had a dispute with another diamond dealer and I took that suit, that dispute, to New York court instead of to, arbitrate, to arbitration, then regardless of the merits of my claim, I would be sanctioned. There is a very jealous hold over disputes that the, that the private governance system, not just in the club, but by the club members, a uh, very uh, jealous hold over all disputes. Um, and by taking your dispute outside to another forum, you are violating, you are breaching, uh, not just a bylaw in the, uh, in the DDC, uh, one of the DDC's bylaws, but you are really breaching um, some code, uh, a norm uh, that is worthy of sanctions. So for sure, uh, and, and by the way, it, it's very interesting to ask why that is. Um, and I don't think the answer is obvious. Uh, I do think that that's a generalizable uh, observation. There are other merchant communities that have private governance systems, and it really has seemed to be a, a violation of a norm to go seek, uh, uh, to, to go pursue a claim in an alternative forum as opposed to the forum they hold. And maybe it's because that would, uh, competing with other dispute resolution mechanisms might dilute the ability to engineer uh, economic and non-economic sanctions. That's possible. I, I don't know if that's the answer. Um, but I think as a general matter, what you see in the diamond industry when dispute resolution was re working really well um, is a general thing. That is, they very generously hold on to complete jurisdiction. Um, and therefore, not only is the public dispute, dispute resolution a substitute, but it's a disfavored substitute um, that really, because of social sanctions, are unavailable. All right. So what happens when the private resolution system starts to break down as it is? Well, what you're seeing more and more um, are disputes, diamond dealers pursuing their claims in public court. Um, and again, you're seeing certain things play out that are really quite significant. Now, first of all, I should have said this. Um, there is a strong history in New York courts, in American courts in general, but specifically in New York courts, um, to invoke the American Arbitration Act whenever diamond dealers approach them. And basically what that means is uh, if these two diamond dealers are subject to an arbitration agreement, which they are if they're members of the diamond club, then New York courts will not intervene. So there was basically a reinforcement of the industry's exclusive jurisdiction. The public courts would not make themselves available. But what happens, which is happening more and more recently, when a diamond dealer says, hey, the arbitration system in the DDC is, is biased against me, is really corrupt. Um, and in that sense, and, and that has that claim has been made, uh, and New York courts have said, look, if there is a denial of due process, if the arbitration system really uh, has lost its credibility as an arbitration system, if there are indications of self-dealing and the like, then we will intervene and we will make public courts available. And that, in many ways, is probably the most severe death knell to uh, the DDC system of private arbitration, because not only is there an outsor outside source available that is a competing with them, but it's only intervening because there's a declaration that the private arbitration system is unreliable. Um, so this also is a story that has not really fleshed out. I think when there's, equal, when there's cooperation, you see a real uh, exclusive commitment to private governance 
uh, and a marginalization of public governance to the degree that anyone who seeks public governance, they are punished by the industry. Um, when you see uh, cooperation start to erode, then you see the public institutions starting to come up again. Now, the, these public institutions still have all of their faults um, that encourage the rise of private governance. There still are a whole bunch of transactions that public courts and contract law cannot enforce. So there'll be real limits to that. But how these two fora co-evolve will be very interesting. And my prediction is that neither will work. My prediction is that we'll see more vertical integration instead, um, precisely because of the historical limits of public courts uh, and the real limits are the emerging limits of, of private arbitration in the diamond industry now. Excellent, thanks so much, Brock. Um, we don't have any more questions in the queue. So if you do have one, go ahead and type it in. I have uh, one more question, Irina, if that's okay. Um, Barak, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the Kimberley process um, as new private governance. I wasn't quite clear what, what you meant by that. And also, I, I just wanted to ask, how is this, um, I mean, I know nothing about this at all, but how is this international political economy of diamonds, as you referred to it, in Africa being affected by um, the Chinese investment in, in Africa, for example, or is it being affected at all by that? Yeah. Um So, so let's talk about the Kimberley process, and maybe that's a way to understand what China is doing also. So, and I, I recognize I threw it out without going in, into any great explanation. So around the turn of the millennium, um, the, the rise of conflict diamonds became a matter of real international concern. And conflict diamonds, again, this was uh, in Liberia and Angola and some other places. Um, very brutal militia groups took hold of uh, some diamond mines or some areas where diamond mining is possible and used the diamonds as hard currency to fuel their very, very bloody campaigns. Um, and of course, you know, uh, it is both a political danger, just a moral danger, if uh, somebody in Los Angeles buying a diamond is fueling a, a bloody rebellion in Liberia, um, that's something that nobody wants, um, but it also uh, poses an existential threat to the diamond industry. Um, nobody would buy diamonds if they thought that there was a chance that their purchase would fuel a, a bloody rebellion um, in Liberia. Uh, so the industry and the UN and some NGOs came together to develop the Kimberley process, which basically is a certification regime. Um, Kimberley process countries, which include all of the large markets, Europe, US, Japan, Hong Kong, China, um, and all of the major diamond sourcing countries that are not plagued by uh, bloody rebellions, um, Botswana, Canada, Australia, um, South Africa. Um, this is a basically a global club where we will allow diamonds to be sold, bought and sold between these two countries. And therefore we all know that we are leaving out the countries that, um, uh, that are procuring blood diamonds. So this was a, an effort with uh, an international effort where the industry and NGOs and the United Nations and other political leaders came together to create a, go to solve a governance problem. And it's what some people have called new private governance, where the industry, where, ind where international industry operates in basically an international regime where there is no one single government um, to create a collaboration. Um, and there are lots of really interesting implications for this. Um, uh, this uh, collaboration among politicians and industry leaders to some degree uh, is emerges only because we only have weak international law. We do not have a single international polity to set rules. Um, uh, some people see that as this is the next phase of, uh, of international corporations asserting their political will over international politics. Um, some people actually are worried that this is another form of collusion. It's another kind of cartel where, um, Certain countries will be left out 
even if they are not um, uh, housing any bloody rebellions, but they are being left out because uh, they threaten the competitive balance. They might be able to inject some entry into the marketplace. There's a certain uh, cartel-like flavor to these political, international political processes. So that's what the Kimberley process is. And there are a number of ways to understand it in a post-Cold World international polity um, to think about how it reflects collaborations between weak international governance uh, and very significantly resourced um, corporate governance or corporate power. Um, now where China comes in is interesting. Uh, and it is true that China is starting to influence itself. It's, it's starting to be, an, you know, it's investing heavily in Africa, not just as an extractor of natural resources, but also as an investor. Um, and as, and part of their strategy, of course, is not just to pull zinc out of the ground, but also to build bridges and highways. Um, and it is possible uh, that China's entry there will either um, fuel another kind of colonialism or might also fuel a different kind of international political economy. I mean, I, I, this is something that I have not given enormous amount of thought to, um, but it is a classic story uh, of, you know, somebody coming in and trying to break up a cartel, um, trying to come in uh, with a new business model, uh, a new strategy to, uh, a new relationship between private economic power and public political power uh, and creating a different kind of institutional marketplace. Um, now, I don't know what that's going to do to diamonds in large part because African diamonds or diamonds mined in Africa uh, are a constant, a, a declining share of global production. Um, but certainly the larger questions about what it means for international politics is significant. And yeah, I really don't know how it's going to play out. It's a great question. So we have another question. Sorry, just found it. Um, well, actually, not a question, uh, but wanted to say thank you for a really clear exposition of the ongoing currency of trust in a contemporary market. Discounting forwards personal welfare through ethnicity in this market is fascinating. I can't think of another modern parallel, so thank you. Uh, silk, spices, and other aspects of private mercantilism seem similar, but they are historic. Yeah, I, I mean, when, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make too big an argument. Um, but when I said that New York uh, offers a modern economy right next to a pre-modern economy, um, I do think that understanding the pre-modern economy in contemporary New York offers a window into the pre-modern economy that involved a whole bunch of other different marketplaces, including spices and textiles. Um, and I think actually in that sense, trying to understand today's, or I'll say the, the diamond industry of the year 2000 in New York, uh, really is a window into understanding the kind of institutional relationship that's, that sustained and created uh, a lot of the pre-legal or pre-modern economy throughout Europe. Um, there are actually one reason why I think that looking at the diamond industry today helps us understand Jewish history throughout Europe from say 1400 to 1700. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, that what we have is a modern analog to a lot of institutions that have lots and lots of historical precedents. Um, and this is very much outside my league, uh, but I, I think if I'm understanding the question right, right uh, I think the question is premised on something that I think is really, really interesting. Thanks so much, Barack. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in um, and it looks like we have just about two minutes left so well, we've timed it right <laughs> yeah it's um it's it's in the evening here so i think people might be ready for their their evening meals or, or, or whatever it is they, they plan to do um so really all i'd like to, to do at this stage is just to thank people for for attending the event 
um, and our events this uh, semester. This is our last event uh, of the of the semester. Uh, so thanks for attending and thanks for all your uh, questions. Um, we will be back in the, the new year with a new schedule of events, which we'll update you with. Um, and for today, I'd just like to say thank you again to Barak for a really stimulating presentation. So uh, the motto of our center is understanding governance dilemmas throughout the world. Um, and I think we've had a really excellent illustration in your presentation of the challenges that there are um, in those dilemmas and actually trying to understand them. Um, so it's been a really great presentation. I've enjoyed it very much. And I do hope we can, um, we can meet in person um, in the not too distant future. So thank you very much, Barak. Um, and thank you again, everybody for for, for coming to the event today. Uh, so thank you. And if you're in the UK or in Europe, have a good evening. If you're elsewhere, enjoy the rest of your day. So goodbye. Thanks, Thanks again for having me. Thank you.